A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord said to me, you are my servant, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, the Lord says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Can the servant of the Lord really do what he says he'll do? This is a big, big deal, brothers. The people to whom he speaks would want to know the answer because this servant speaks to an Israelite people that has been exiled now for decades. At the time he speaks, multiple generations have now been born into exile. Israel's tradition remembers a 40-year wandering after the Exodus. This surpasses even that. Can we try and imagine ourselves members of this lonely, refugee people. We see ourselves as chosen by God, but also know that our people rejected and ignored God so completely that even a stream of God's prophets and wonder workers did not draw us back. We know our exile is a reality rooted in the horrifying evil we as a people had done in Israel. Our corrupt rulers, who cheated people of their land, sacrificed their children as burnt offerings, did every other kind of evil imaginable, and we as a people who followed their example. Our priests, who were supposed to work against these evils and cleanse the effects of communal sin, but who weren't committed enough to the task that God gave them, and even prophets whose job it was to name evil so that they could be rooted out and who instead whitewashed this whole mess. We remember that God himself spoke to Ezekiel the prophet and told him that he had sought someone, anyone, preserved from corruption, that had he found even one, he would have saved us from ourselves again. We know the story painfully well, that God waited patiently, called us over and over to return to him. But we persevered in sin until this rot was complete. We are part of a people who turned wholly away from a God who had chosen us. How can we protest our exile in Babylon? But now in Babylon, person by person, as a nation, We turn to God, strive to turn from the evil of the past, await God's mercy. Can this servant of the Lord really mean that he's been destined from the womb to reverse this exile, restore a fallen, chosen people to the promised land? He's a fraud, or he's the answer to our prayers. It shouldn't be too hard for us today to imagine a people longing for deliverance. Our country, among the most prosperous in the world, teems with those who feel trapped by lack of money, all kinds of violence, overwork, loneliness. The list could go on. And in a presidential election year, it shouldn't be too hard to imagine would-be leaders vying for the belief of a people. Make no mistake, this is something the servant is doing. If we read more of this passage, it's not less clear, it's more clear. It sounds like a trumpet blast. The first verse begins, Hear me, coastlands, listen, distant peoples. He calls everyone to attention. He says, God told me, I'm his servant. I was made and born to lead you back to the promised land. God told me I'm the tool he will use now to do this quickly, surely, as surely as a good sword cuts, as a sharp arrow pierces. He's telling this people he'll deliver them. Can he do it? Christian tradition sees this servant as a preview of Jesus, and the servant's words is more fitting in Jesus' mouth than in the mouth of any other. Jesus, who's shown himself in history able to do all that the servant promises and more, 
And Christians believe the living Jesus speaks his message today just as earnestly as ever before. Listen, O people, he says, and hear the love in his voice. I came and lived and died and rose so that you could all share my life, the life of God. There's a weight to belief that the one who shares in Jesus' life, no matter how poor, becomes rich and stores up treasure in eternity, may suffer any violence and still trust Jesus' power over death, may bring any burden to Christ and trust that he'll help carry it. Jesus knows about all our burdens, that they can feel more than we can bear. But he helps bear them. He does it through his sacraments, through baptism, a real sharing in living, dying, and going beyond death through the Eucharist, turning bread and wine into his very flesh and blood to nourish us, give us food for our souls, through confession, where he pours out abundant mercy and grace upon us in a privileged way and place, through his teaching, preserved in the scriptures, entrusted to his apostles and their successors, and to us as members of his mystical body here on earth. Yes, Jesus Christ, the servant of the Lord, light to the nations, promises abundantly And he has the power to deliver on all his promises. So will we reject him? Will we ignore him? Will we turn to him?